take me back to Titanic and, and fill me in. My heart will. Uh, you know what's funny? I would want to do that same exact thing. Get in line, brother. <laughs> wow. I like want to make a joke, but also that could be triggering. <laughs> no, that's good. No. Like farmers yeah. would be like, what? I'm going to be an actor. Put me in film school. And he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> so uh, I don't need to torture myself for no reason. Exactly. The world is tough enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As an audience member, I want to be like left on the edge of my seat a little bit. Welcome to Amigos PC. If you were looking for a podcast with high standards and an appreciation for the finer things in life, like water polo, ballet, equestrian riding, cricket, and trips to the countryside, uh, you're in the wrong place. If you're looking for a podcast that celebrates drinking, random thoughts, wacky conspiracies, memes, crypto, cinema, and a lot of other things that don't really make any sense, then you're in the right place. This is Amigos PC, and here are your hosts, Scott and Mark. Hey, you. Yeah, you. You're hearing this for a reason. You haven't subscribed to the Amigos membership on Supercash yet. Uh, for as little as $5, you can get access to our feed with no ads and exclusive membership discounts and merch. Jump up to our $30 tier and get everything plus direct access to us via our Discord channel, live Amigo AMAs, quarterly giveaways, and crypto merch. For a dollar a day or less, you can support an Amigo app. The Amigos back at it again. Today we have a special guest that ha is an indie filmmaker. She has a short that is premiering out on the streams currently called The Day We Left. Alma Begovic. Vic, sorry. And see, I tell you, right as soon as yeah. it comes yeah. on, I, I just ruin it with saying the name uh, off letters but if you could uh just yeah. <laughs> introduce yourself a little bit tell us a little bit about you what makes your world and all that stuff i actually want to start off by saying that you had it right the first oh, time geez. elma begovic was perfect <laughs> that begovic thing is yeah. the Amer americanization of of slavic last names or as mm. we slavs like to say the bastardization of our names <laughs> uh. <laughs> yes my name is elma i'm an independent filmmaker i write produce and act in mostly short films right now because i uh, started making my own projects back in 2017 i started out as like a hustling actor who you know to la and was struggling to get auditions and roles and i was like well f it i'll just start writing and making my own stuff and Fast forward to a few years later, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, write, produce, and carry out these short films to festivals. And here we are with The Day We Left, which is my third short film in two and a half years. So oh, I'm nice. proud of that. Is there personal inspiration drawn from this film or like, or drawn to make this film? Absolutely, yeah. I myself am a Bosnian immigrant, a former refugee myself, and um, this story in particular is based, it's sort of a combination of my life story and the director, Kyle Kathriner. He's a Vancouver-based director. Who, he's the one who actually approached me to work on this project. I had a short film called Undone on, a fest, on the festival circuit back in 2019, and it played in Sarajevo, my home, my home country, the capital of Bosnia, which is my home country, and he found my info there there, reached out and said, you know, I have a friend who is Bosnian and her story inspired me. I want to make a movie out of that. And I said, that's awesome. Being Bosnian myself, you know, I have a lot of similar experiences to your friend. Can we, you know, maybe combine the two stories? And that's what we did. So the short film version that we have on the circuit right now is largely based on his friend's story, the Hodzic family. But the feature that I'm currently rewriting and working on has a lot more of my personal family's history sprinkled in there. When I watched it, I just had this feeling that this almost could be like a, a story that was told from either like your parents or your grandparents of the time and then like you actually going through it. So it's amazing to hear that like you actually you're relating to it on, on a, another level than just 
being the, the actor of it, if that makes sense. Totally. I mean, I left Bosnia in a produce truck. So oh, though wow. I was very oh. though I was very little, I was three and a half when the war started, you know, I definitely grew up knowing that I was a refugee and you know, I, I lived in a refugee center in Berlin for six years. I was an asylum seeker there. My family was sent back to Bosnia after the war because we were, you know, illegally entered Germany and we weren't granted the right to stay. So then we lived in post-war Bosnia as displaced persons. <laughs> and then finally I worked my way to citizenship in Canada. So, you know, you say that Mark, that it feels like a story that belongs to my grandparents, but really, yeah, I, I lived through a lot of that myself. And and it was a lot of, you know, gathering my parents, my family members, and uh, conducting interviews, you know, asking my mom, hey, what was it like fleeing through your country with me, my twin sister, and my older sister, like, and my dad, like, what, what was that experience like? My mom was, I think, two or three years younger than I am now when all this, when all this happened. So a lot of that made, it, made its way into the short film. Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I, but you, 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 you think of you think of when you hear, you know, us, you know, in the in the American bubble, right? You think of all right, the, the worst things are always, you know, you think of World War Two. Right? Everything else has been, you know, rosies and and, and and rainbows. So when you hear something that, you know, you're you know, young and that you basically you've lived through it and you you basically were smuggled out of the country because of craziness. Yeah. It makes First it of all, Scott, more... thank you for calling me young. That is very oh, kind. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, smuggled through in a produce truck. And I, I worked that part into the feature for sure because I always find it so funny. Like, I didn't eat a lot of vegetables growing up. I actually grew up on chocolate. And it's so funny that I left my country in a produce truck. I eat my greens now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, did that make it a little bit more difficult or... Maybe the better question is, like, how did emotions then play in something that potentially, like, you're almost reliving in an aspect of your life? Yeah, I mean, you, you said you were a lot younger than, you know, a, a toddler. So I don't know if maybe you recall most of it, but, like, I feel like emotion would really play heavy in, in, in something like this since you're reliving some of it. Totally. I feel like it's almost, it's a rite of passage, right? Like as story for me as a storyteller, like I knew this, I knew I had to make a project that was based on, you know, the Bosnian experience or the Bosnian war. Like that's just something I had to do. To be honest with you, while we were filming, this is the thing about working all sides of the industry. When you are hired as an actor on a production that isn't your own, you have the luxury of like showing up to set, waiting in your trailer, and you're there to facilitate a part. And then when you're done, you leave because it's someone else's baby, it's someone else's project that's being, you know, you're just facilitating a part. Whereas this, like I was a co-writer for the short film with the director. I was a co-producer with three other people, four other people. And then on top of that, we you know, built crew and cast of about 35 people. So unfortunately, I didn't have the luxury as an actor to just like enjoy myself in the moment and immerse myself in the scene because at the same time, you're also thinking, okay, we have six more scenes to shoot after this. We got a break for lunch. We have to make sure that the crew is fed. Plus we shot during COVID. So there was a lot of stuff going on. And when we get to filming the feature, I think I'll definitely have to carve out some more, I guess, like energy and space to really be able to like invest fully as an actor. Because I think that's something that a lot of indie filmmakers struggle with is finding the balance. You work so hard to get these projects made or to get the funding to get them off the ground. And then you get like three days to shoot and you sometimes just can't give all of yourself but i'm working on that well it seems like you were you took it or are you doing it as like a acting as a whole is what i'm saying as like an entrepreneurial avenue right like you, you were having trouble getting spots for auditions things like that and i mean who wouldn't in this climate that we're in it's just ridiculous with all of the nonsense that's going in the world but you're like, you know what, forget it. I'm going to make it my own and I'm going to do my own thing and, and uh, build thing and build, you know, a movie or make a movie, things like that. You said that you've done like other projects beyond just this one. So was is this your first 
self-made slash funded co-made slash funded produced thing like that or, or have you have other projects that are lined up or have done this is my third okay it's my first so i started my own production company back in 2017 in la seek refuge productions how appropriate for a former refugee right <laughs> <laughs> And yeah, so I made my first short film called Undone. And that was, you know, like I had no money. I had a couple of, like I had some money from a residual check that I got. I did a Crest mouthwash commercial and that baby fed me for a few months when I first moved to LA. And yeah, I remember sitting, it was outside the Melrose Market on Fairfax. I remember sitting with my partner and saying, man, I just like can't get a break. I can't get, my agent can't get me in because she keeps saying that my credits aren't good enough for like the casting directors in LA to want to even audition me. And I don't have connections in the industry yet where, you know, people can just like nepotize me in. <laughs> I don't think nepotize is a word, but you know what I mean? Like yeah. mm -hmm. homie mm -hmm. hookups. Yeah. And that's, and I said, okay, I've got this residual check. And instead of like blowing it on, you know, clothes and dinners or like, you know, two cocktails in LA, I'll put it into making a short film. And that I think I say this a lot, but once you open that door of like making something from, you know, inception to conceptualization and like final product on a screen, watching it with people in a theater, it's so hard to go back to waiting and like waiting for someone to give you permission to, to play and to act. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, I, I, I honestly, I'm so inspired by other entrepreneurial filmmakers like Issa Rae and Ava DuVernay, like all of these women who are also marginalized women, but like just didn't didn't see a representation of themselves on the screen that they wanted to. So they were like, we'll go do that. And I think for like female storytelling, particularly immigrant stories that are centered on immigrant women, like we're not, you know, we're still in the infancy stages of that. So it's my hope to keep facilitating these stories. And yeah, I think that making, having ownership of your work is really important nowadays, especially if you want to tell authentic stories. So I'm all about, I tell everybody who reaches out to me, part of my production company's goal is to also foster internship programs and like help uh, up and coming filmmakers. And I always say like, pick up your phone and get a friend and just start shooting because that's the only way that you're going to get your foot in the door. It, unless you have connections or you come from an industry family or you are Timothy Chalamet, like people aren't just going to open doors for you. <laughs> Right. Well, I love Come that on, Timmy you say it. <laughs> I love that you say it that way, though, because I mean, as someone that's like not in the industry, me, me and Scott, obviously, we're not actors. You know, we, we started this podcast. Yeah, we gave it and, up. And we're making we our own up. thing. You know, trying to be in in some kind of show business. I guess I don't know. I don't know if you would call podcasting that, but it's a show business. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. But what I was it's trying an, to get an amazing is, show. Come on, Mark. You're saying like, hey, it's not all roses, right? The, the road isn't clear. The path isn't made for you. And I love that you're saying this to other people that, you know, are coming to your production company and things like that and, and helping you know, apprenticeships and, and such. That it's okay to, to get in there, get your hands dirty. And, and if you have to do this yourself because it's a passion or a dream, it's the, that's the road you have to take. And I love that. Absolutely. I like I'm self taught, you know, I come from immigrant parents. When the time came for me to go to post secondary, like my mom and dad were not about to pay for film school. <laughs> I was like, I remember graduating high school and my dad's like, okay, like you all have to go to, to college of some kind. Like, what do you want to do? And I'm like, I'm going to be an actor. Put me in film school. And he was like, absolutely not. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I will get a language degree and then I'll bounce and I'll start my acting journey. And yeah, like, so I didn't have a lot of the you know like the upper hand of going to film school which is you, you learn a lot but you don't need it you don't need to go to school to learn how to follow your passion like if there's this innate inkling in you to tell a story i think you'll find a way to do that and i'm always down to help people like i 
you know, I, I make my own stuff, but friends call me up and they say, hey, we need someone to help light for this project or hey, we need someone to stand in. And I'm like, yeah, I'll for sure. Because I know what it's like when you're making things for, I, I also like to say this, indie filmmaking is like having champagne taste, but having beer bottle money. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. you have to rely on, <laughs> you have to rely on your community and for people to come and help you out, but you got to be willing to help others too. It, almost like if you're a stand-up comic, right? You don't, you're not famous and and booking theaters immediately. So that's that's all, and, and you have to build a, an audience. Uh, as a, mm-hmm. Even in podcasting, you have to build an audience. It's yeah. very mm-hmm. relatable. And I love that. What I love about comedy, for example, is the same thing I love about professional like acting like basketball players and comedians they bring their community up with them Mm -hmm. like when they make it they're like okay the people that I struggled with are coming up with me and I think that sometimes in the entertainment world that gets a little convoluted because when people we're taught like as as actors especially we're taught to always be in competition with one another even if like Mm -hmm. you're not a like you're not the same gender you're not competing for the same looks or styles or whatever somehow we've been programmed to think that everyone's your competitor and then it becomes so hard to sometimes you know share resources or offer help and that stigma is something that every artist in my vortex is working to dismantle because it's just unhealthy Mm -hmm. and it doesn't really progress anyone so i take a page from comedians and ballers in that in that department (laughs) oh you mean like the rock from ballers hbo no i'm just kidding no No. (laughs) that was i liked his character in that show i didn't finish the whole series but i thought he was (laughs) balling that was a good show i didn't finish it either i think i got to like season four yeah, there's just so much content out there, Scott. Like, mm-hmm. how do you keep up with everything? Well, you, you bring that up. So is there like a genre or something that you like, you know, I got to like Scott. Scott loves The Office. Like he can't get oh. enough of it. Is there something out there that yeah, where you kind of, it's kind of a problem, honestly, <laughs> I, I call it I call it like it's so old people that I know Not us, that I have like grandparents, way. right? No, no, not us. Grandparents. They they'll watch like westerns, right? <laughs> That's like their thing. Like I'm starting to think that like, The Office is like my western because like I would put it like I'm watching my stories and I'll watch it to like go to sleep. Absolutely. Are you? And, do you watch the super fan episodes? Because that's the level I'm on. Like I watch The Office super fan episodes extended. What are those? What are those? Wow. Peacock. Wow. Has... Yeah. No. Oh. Now now there's more content. Now you got my mind blown. That's it's, not good. it's funny because actually my my friends are huge office fans and uh i don't like watching the office with my partner and my best friend antoine because they quote every scene oh, oh yeah that's me that's me and i actually just gifted my friend for christmas a mug that says scott's tots on it <laughs> and then in nice. the back oh, it's the God, rap hey mr scott what yeah, you gonna what do? you gonna do what, what you, you gonna, gonna do? do make your dreams come uh, true <laughs> i know so good yeah, good comedy is always on the top of my list. I audition for a lot of dramas. I audition for a lot of heavy stuff. So what I like to watch is things that like make me belly laugh. And The Office makes me like, cack- is the word cackle? Yeah. Like I go. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Now that's a cackle. I do that too when I watch it. Who's your favorite character? Oh, man. Uh, that's a good one. It's tough. It is tough. I have to say Michael. Oh, Michael or Dwight? Yeah. I know those are like two low hanging fruit, but yeah, my two favorite. What about you, Mark? Are you an Office fan? Yeah, not as diehard as Scott or Aura. It seems like you either. My favorite character, jeez, ah, I can't even think of his name, but it's the HR guy. Oh, Toby. Toby. Yeah. Toby. I have a theory that Toby has just been stoned the entire time <laughs> during the entire <laughs> series. Through the whole shooting? Like, <laughs> because his yeah. eyes are always so, like, sorry. I can see that. I'm actually an Angela awesome. fan. I just love how oh, cutthroat oh. she is. She, she loves is. Jesus and cats, and she hates everyone else. <laughs> everything, everything else. Everything else but that. So true. <laughs> They're all perfect, honestly, because even Creed has the mystery. 
of him, like the Creed. Oh yes, oh, yeah. Oh, so in one of the extended episodes, it's when Mer when Michael hits Meredith with his car, mm -hmm. and there's a cl there's a scene where she, they all visit Meredith, and or he hits Meredith with her car. They all visit Meredith in the hospital, and Creed does this little thing where he drinks Me Meredith's like medicine and then uh. leaves. It didn't make the real episode, but it was just the actor. The actor's na real name is Creed. His Creed. He played yeah. Creed. And you just, he's so committed because even when the shot wasn't on him, you see Creed like stayed committed and in character until he left the room. Like that's a devoted actor right there. Heck yeah. Good stuff. Okay, yes. away from the office we go. This is, this yeah. podcast yeah. is not about the office. I know. I know. <laughs> so yeah, definitely died talk, down there. <laughs> we could, I, I, could get, I could make this whole episode about it. Talking shop. So when you, when you shoot a short, does that mean, is it just like, you're wanting like a production agency to pick it up and like do a whole film of it. Is that kind of how shorts normally work with us not knowing? Like we've been out of the, out of Hollywood for years, so we don't know the ins and outs anymore. So let me, I'm let just me curious. bring you back. Yeah. Bring me back. Take me back to Titanic and, and fill me in. My heart will. <laughs> just kidding. I'm actually tone deaf, so I should stop singing. No, that was yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the this short film in particular, we made through the Harold Greenberg grant, which is a Bell Media grant we got from Canada. We shot this project in Vancouver. And uh, yeah, the hope is to get funding to shoot the full feature. So mm -hmm. when we actually submitted for this grant to get the short film made, I had already written the feature script. So that's been, this project has been in the works for a couple of years and I'm working on re Rights right now uh, behind me and around me. Are all I, those see it. I see it on the board. Yes, yeah, story, I'm storyboarding. And yeah, so that is the goal. I think it's really hard to get cap. Like, it's so hard to get money to get projects made. And short films are a great way to start so that you can hopefully show people like it's a proof of concept and here's where we want to go with it. You know, I'm an indie filmmaker, like I said. So a lot of the time you're relying on, you know, funding things yourself or, you know, crowdfunding, angel investors. Sometimes you just hit up your friends and family and you're like, hey, I don't want holiday gifts. I don't want a birthday gift. Can you just help <laughs> fund my short film? <laughs> Nice. Every Which is why counts. I think I don't have any more friends. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> no self-deprecating humor. That's allowed here, right? Of course. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we, we, we enjoy it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so that's okay. All right. So that makes sense. Because I was just curious. Like when I, because when I watched it, I was like, A, I was like, well, this is, I, when I told Mark, I was like, this is a, this, this one. It, it's a heavy, <laughs> it's a heavy short, let's just say, mm -hmm. but I wanted more because I was like, oh, I need to know more. Like, I want to see the rest of the yeah. story. And so I, it had me. Yeah, going. that's the goal of a short film is you want to like depict a moment in a character's life or a journey. Yeah. And you don't really want to like, it's not like a beginning, middle and an end. You kind of want to leave people with some kind of a cliffhanger or an openness so that they can crave more. I also think traditional filmmaking like is out the door. Like a lot of feature films now do the same thing, right? Like a lot of movies yeah. are ending abruptly or actually just last night I, I showed my partner uh, Ingrid Goes West. Have you guys seen that movie? I've not seen that one. Is From it good? 2017. Is it older? Yeah, oh, Aubrey okay. Plaza, Elizabeth Olsen really plays on like the influencer Instagram like LA world. Mm. But yeah, the movie ends Mark, in like that's a Mark's way. Scene. That's oh, Mark's okay. scene. Yeah. Okay, then you should put Ingrid Goes West on your on your to watch. He's gonna list. watch it tonight. <laughs> but yeah, the movie ended, and my partner was like, "Well, that's a weird way for it to end." And I'm like, "Yes, not everything is like packaged together in a beautiful like Hollywood paintbrush for you, like you know." Which is good. Like, I enjoy those more because I don't I don't want the happy ending or same. I do like the you know the, the <laughs> bad endings too. You know, like you want you want you want to. They gotta change it up sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. it can't always be again rainbows and and kittens. Yeah, uh, especially because there's just so much content. There is so much content yes. being put out that I think, like I, I love a good rom com. I love a good horror movie where I know all the beats that are gonna happen. But I'm much more drawn to watch, you know, stories that 
take me somewhere else or that take like a an average plot twist and then do something completely different with it and like as an audience member I want to be like left on the edge of my seat a little bit and so that's what you know I'm trying to as a writer I'm trying really hard to achieve that I'm trying I'm trying to every time I write a scene and I'm like no this feels like I've seen it or heard it or read it before back nice. to the drawing board we go that's good that's good yeah that's gonna be I think that's I think that's the formula which I'm sure a lot of writers are trying to do but that's I think that's what's gonna get more people so I think what it is nowadays is like the word of mouth or the buzz around how the movie is so I think if you have that that's gonna be that different you know that difference maker is gonna be what people need because there are so many choices out there yeah people for sure. need to Especially if you, know, again, you don't come from like a big studio and you don't have the big dollars to like do promoting and, and you know, advertising and all that. Back in the day, it used to be commercials, but like who, who has cable anymore? <laughs> like, exactly. True. True. Well, let me ask you this then. So obviously your upbringing and when you went to secondary school, college, right? You didn't go to acting school. So like wh where did it start? And like... What what steps did you take to truck. learn? It was a produce truck. Oh, well, I know that. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it started I... at the produce truck. <laughs> Come on, Mark. He wasn't listening. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. No. I tuned out for a second. Sorry, guys. No. <laughs> no, like, I talk like, a lot. Where where did you put your foot in the door for acting? And then, I mean, you you just don't all of a sudden wake up one day and and know how to make a short film or even just a film in general. So, like, what? Where were you inspired or like, how, how did you figure this out? So I grew up, I spent most of my formative years in a refugee center in Berlin. Like I said, I'm, I was born in Bosnia and my family lived, uh, we were asylum seekers, we were refugees in Berlin during the Bosnian war. And um, I have a twin sister. And I think the first time that I, I knew I like liked performing was in this, like this refugee center was like an apartment complex. It was like an old dormitory for college students. And then they gave each family like a dorm room. You know, we, it was times of war. You don't know if you're going to be there for two months or two years, but it had like a big common space. And so my twin sister and I were like, let's put on a play. Let's put on a play and let's charge 25 cents. Let's make some money. Like, yeah. let's make money so we can go buy some candy. Like, you know, this is the mid nineties. I was like fueled by candy and chocolates. And so that was like the first time that I saw like how people reacted to my being funny or goofy or like putting on a character. And I just knew. Plus, again, you know, I didn't have a lot growing up. Like I didn't have a lot of toys. So t the TV was always on. And I just consumed so much television for like an eight year old. I think I was the only eight year old who watched Bridges of Madison County and went to school and was like, should we unpack the relationship between Clint Eastwood and Meryl Streep's character? Because that was deep. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Good movie. Good movie. <laughs> and then my German teacher sends my parents a note and is like, Elma needs to watch more age appropriate movies. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but that was like the inkling, the beginning. And then when I moved to Canada, like I didn't take drama in school because I was like, school is school, acting is my work. I got to take private classes. So I somehow convinced my parents to pay for classes. And I just took private acting classes until I was like 16, 17. And then I, I shot my first indie movie when I was 19, my first year of college. It never saw the light of day, but uh, it was my first experience on a set and like being the lead in a movie and all that stuff. And then as soon as I graduated university in Edmonton, Alberta, I told my parents I was going to go to Toronto to check out master's programs. But really, I was taking agent meetings and like setting up a housing situation so I could move. And then I moved to <laughs> Toronto and started hustling. <laughs> nice. Hey, if you have a dream... Yeah and a desire if there's a will there's a way right yep. yes and i think for for me in particular like i just 
since I was young, you know, I've been like people have placed identities onto me without my permission, you know, like, hey, you're a refugee. Hey, you're an asylum seeker. Hey, you're this. And I have always identified as actor. I'm Elma and I'm an actor. Like I tell <laughs> stories and I just refuse to, to believe that a no existed for me. Because even when I moved to Toronto, my friends were like, hey, that's a bold move. You don't know anyone there. You don't have an agent. And I was like, don't you worry about me. Like, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and slowly nice. I did. That's good. So what's the scenes like then? There are the differences in the scenes from like the Toronto filming arena versus like LA and the, the differences between those two. So Toronto was... Well, Toronto was my introduction to the indie horror scene. I started, I, I, I booked my first big horror in Toronto called a movie called Fight, and that did really well in like a, a genre festival market. And it, I mean, it's where I really made most of my uh, industry friends. But it was just, you know, I, 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 I never felt like it was going to be my forever place. I knew I wanted to shift gears and bite had gotten me enough like good press that I could I started thinking about applying for my O1 which is your uh, alien of extraordinary ability visa that we as actors have wow. to get in order to come and work in the states like you can't just decide hey I want to go work in America you know oh, wow. follow paperwork and all that and so I like uh, that title by the way yeah, yeah it's, it's very title. exotic and yeah it's very I it's very awesome you have superpowers at this point <laughs> yeah. I, I mean it's yeah, shooting webs, that's cool. <laughs> but I love that. I'm like, I am technically not a human in America. I am an alien. <laughs> Don't at me, okay? <laughs> yep, yep. That's funny that you call it that. Just wow. kidding, I'm a human, I'm a human. <laughs> Peace to all. <laughs> So the scenes do differ, like LA is very cutthroat and I find that LA is very much like a vibe attracts tribe and you get cast a lot based on like your, you as, as a person, which I think is cool because sometimes when you click with people, uh, you can, you know, you can tweak a character if somebody likes you as a person, right? But uh, therein also lies the problem that sometimes people just like casting, you know, whoever they like. Vancouver, I, I, I'm really enjoying working in Vancouver. I'm finding that the industry there is really warm and the artists are super kind. Like there's not a lot of resource hoarding like we talked about. You know, when I moved to Vancouver or I, I went to Vancouver in 2020 to work on a project not knowing anybody. And now two years later, I would say I have like a great network of not just producers, but actors, costume designers, sound engineers, visual artists, because it's, you know, still cozy enough of, an, of a community where people like want to see you strive and thrive. In LA, it's harder. Like I've been calling LA home on and off for the last five years, but I, you know, I would say I have work acquaintances and, 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 and I'm building a work community, but it is more challenging to like pick up the phone in LA and ask friends, hey, can you, can you come help, you know, make my short film? Like, hmm, what's in it for me? Yeah. <laughs> or like, are there any A-listers there? <laughs> Well, that's the difference, right? Canadians are the, the nice guys that come over and bring you the syrup. Right? Yeah, eh? Here, though, no one's going to answer the phone here. <laughs> so, and, yeah, and you know, I don't, I don't want to be like too stereotypical. You know, like there are there are Canadians that aren't so wonderful as well, and there are Americans who are who are rays of sunshine. You're talking about the lumberjacks, um, right? <laughs> yeah, you know what? I went as a lumberjack for Halloween a few years ago. <laughs> I've never nice. chopped down a tree in my life. I don't think I can even make fire. If I were on Survivor, they would kick me off. I would lose very quickly. <laughs> they would make the fire making competition and I'd be out in a second. I just think I give up. This isn't for me. Or even like a, a Alone Naked in the Woods or whatever that show's called where like they have to build oh, a hut. Oh, hell no. <laughs> yeah. No. There's no way. I'm down oh. to go camping. I will, you know... I'll fix a broken tire. I'm not afraid to roll my sleeves up and do some work, but like, I don't need to torture myself for no reason. Exactly. The world is tough enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. true. Not enough money in it for me. No. 
which is funny because my dad is so into that stuff. Like when I go to visit my parents, like my dad is into hunting now. He's a man who has three daughters and has never learned anything that like intrigues us as females, but like pushes his beliefs on us so hard. And yeah, my dad's always like playing that uh, naked alone in the wilderness, <laughs> you need to survive. Or like hunters taking down their prey. And I'm like, dad, we're having dinner. Like, can you, can you turn that off? Like, it's so unappealing. Like, I'm one no, of those people a, that can't his, eat when his, you watch that. He's in, he's in his whole flannel outfit or his camo. Leaves, yes. leaves, Scott. <laughs> yeah. Oh, leaves. Yes, yeah. and he's got a very thick accent too. So he's like, Elma, this is how people survive. This is nature. <laughs> Why are you upset? <laughs> no, they don't. <laughs> no, I go to a grocery sprouts. store down the street, Dad. <laughs> the grocery store. That's right. The, I, get, well, I get it though. If, th if things hit the fan, he is the one to go. You're going to go to his house. But, yeah. But, but yeah. And that's the argument he makes. He's like, I don't hunt for pleasure. I hunt for for food. And I'm just like, bro, I see the frozen Costco <laughs> meat in your freezer, <laughs> like. <laughs> Don't play me, Daddy. <laughs> you should just take that home with him. You're gonna go get your own meat. Yeah. Right? I'm taking your Costco meat home. Yeah. Because I, mean, I don't hunt. You do. Yeah. And it's freaking expensive meat. When I moved out on my yeah. own, I became a vegan out of necessity because meat and cheese are expensive. Oh yeah. And, and it keeps people going who up. are struggling can't afford it. <laughs> yeah. So true. Chris couldn't pay for the for the meat and cheese. <laughs> No. They pay for the movie, remember? They pay for my first short film. Bless Come them. On, Mark. See, he's he's like thirty minutes behind. I am. We'll catch him up. He's sleeping. Yeah, he is. I need to. Jeez. Yeah, Mark's in the middle of a move. He's gonna be moving out of his house. Oh, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> yeah, he lost it. He lost the house. Oh. <laughs> no, he's selling. In the divorce. Yeah. In the divorce. <laughs> I like want to make a joke, but also that could be triggering. <laughs> no, that's good. No. <laughs> so we're, we're family here. Just go ahead. Yeah. We're family. You can, you can say whatever. <laughs> I feel you though, Mark. I am. My partner and I bought a fixer upper. And oh, nice. we are starting like demolition on this baby in a few weeks. And I have not even purchased a box to start packing things. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just, oh. I just believe that if I don't think about it, that maybe somehow it'll take care of itself. So I'm just going to Oh my God, we think alike. We think alike. Yeah. I'll just ride that train until reality slaps me in the face. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so you guys actually plan on living in it. Uh, you're not going to like flip it or something like that, huh? No, I, that's the other thing about, you know, this tumultuous upbringing I've had, you know, I've never lived in a house. I, I, I was born, my parents built a house. I lived in it for two months. This war happened and I have lived my whole life in like apartment buildings and complexes and all that. And this is the first First time that you know I am a, a homeowner and I, I have a, a house nice. that I'm turning into a home for myself and yeah the thing I'm most excited about is actually building my office I've never had a space to actually work I've always you know had a nook or I worked in I've shared offices with people and at the end of the day the produce like, truck yeah <laughs> produce truck call back to the produce truck <laughs> so I'm excited to get an office going Very so cool. talk to me in six months <laughs> nice yeah, we we used to have a studio for the podcast, and the, honestly, the work that we did there was just amazing. And the, now I don't. Know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. You did? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. Where, where was I? It's all downhill we, now. No, <laughs> we did. We did have a nice office, but yeah, yeah. Honestly, I, I think we didn't. Do, we didn't do leaving the office. Probably was better for the podcast as like viewership because we are like beyond what we used to be at least. In the office. Yeah. yeah. Not to be serious. I mean, I do miss a little bit of like office culture. I'm, you know, my work is self paced too, and I don't have like a set nine to five schedule. But I do miss having a space to like take meetings and do things. I feel like working from home, like, you know, <laughs> you got, I am presentable here, but like sweatpants are underneath this, you know oh, what yeah. I mean? I oh, feel you're like wearing you're wearing pants. Yeah, you're wearing, yeah, pants. You're wearing, <laughs> you're wearing <laughs> pants. Nice. <laughs> I'm only wearing them because it's, you know, nighttime and cold. Otherwise, That's I'd true. be in my underwear That's too. <laughs> but yeah, I think I've just become a little bit lazy and sometimes I'm just a gremlin all day long and I'm like, girl, like, 
put a little effort in and just like leave the house for five minutes. Like this week, I don't think I left my compound, my house all week. Tomorrow I shall go somewhere. I shall see, I shall the, see the sun tomorrow. tomorrow. I mean, that's kind of I the environment be. we've been pushed into <laughs> though, right? I mean, it's it's yeah, been yeah, a tough true. couple years and I think people have scaled back. And you talked okay. about, you know, building your network and things like that. I don't think people are doing that anymore right now or even like just the last couple of years. And if they are, it's very virtual, kind of similar to what we're doing now. Yeah, it's a yeah. Networking has become a very virtual space. Like I am a member of Women in Film here in LA, and it used to be you know an opportunity to go and like you'd have monthly meetups and, and stuff like that. Great way to network and meet other female you know filmmakers. But now it's all virtual, and it does it. You you hit a little bit of like a fatigue moment, you know. I, I think there's only so much of this that we can do. Like I work in front of my screen, you know, for work all day long, and then it's sometimes hard to also stay on the screen to then you know network and be social as well. Yeah, a lot of socially distant walks with friends and a lot of introspective downtime, which I, I think that's okay too, right? Like going yeah. inward every once in a while. But I sure miss like getting dressed up and going to a crowded place and like partying with my friends. Like I miss those days. And I'm like I'm 32 now, so I like I feel like I only have a few years to party. So like let's go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get me back in a club. <laughs> it's so funny because I like true. I want nothing to do. With it. <laughs> yeah, same here. Same here. I, I'm Why, all for going do? out and hanging out and you know hanging out with friends and things like that. But like the the club scene and just like, uber amount of people. Unless like I can get my own like little area that I can invite people in that I prefer. I, I guess I'm just picky. I don't know. Oh, you want to be a VIP? Yeah, there we go. Oh, I'm bougie yeah. like that. I'm bougie. I need to be in, you know, my own little corner, the champagne room, whatever you want to call it. Okay. Okay. So I'll only invite you when I'm doing luxurious things and I have a yeah. private party. Exactly. Yeah, I'll bring the checkbook too, just in case we got a fun to move. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's what I do. I talk people up every chance I get. No, I'm not that go. insufferable. I'm not that insufferable. <laughs> It'll, it'll just be one of those things Mark will say, don't cash the check till Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why is the why is Nancy on this day? I thought your name was Mark. Whose checkbook is this? Who is this? Look, look on the back of it. it, just, it says, and that's why the house is being gone. <laughs> <laughs> this is the true way of how I lost the house. That's, that's really, really what happened. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, no, like over here in, in Nashville, Tennessee, where I'm at, I'm not in Nashville, but I'm down the street. I'm yeah, you're about around 20 the miles from it. We get it. Around the corner. <laughs> and Nashville apparently is called Nash Vegas. Oh. So, or at least I've heard somebody say that. I only heard one person. I don't know how valid that is. But, you know, if you've ever been to Vegas, you know how Vegas is, or at least know how it is, obviously. But yeah, but think of it like, you know, it's, it's a country bar, like, strip of people just partying and drinking and singing and live music the whole time. And so going there, like Mark's, what Mark said, basically the, the loud, I'm at the point where like loud music and all that, I'm like, we need to go to like a more quieter spot and like be able to talk, talk to the people that I'm with. I'm at that point. I mean, I like fun. hearing people talk too, but I just, it's been, I've been listening to people talk for two years. Like, let me get oh, out yeah. and twerk a little and then I'll talk a little. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> just kidding. I don't know how to twerk. Who are we kidding? <laughs> yeah. Me neither. Some things are better left for other people. <laughs> but I was I was down there last weekend and it was still very crazy. Bumping, oh, yeah. for real? Bumping. I was, yeah. yeah I had somebody I've... somebody in town, so I met them down there. Oh, and see that's why I haven't been hosting much during the pandemic because everybody comes to LA and they're like, Take me here, take me there, take me to Beverly Hills, take me to the beach and I'm like I'm avoiding people. There you so, go. do you just want to hang out in my apartment? That'd be fun too. The beach yep. is closed. Yeah. So we met we met them in Nashville, so they, we didn't have to actually, yeah, see them. But yeah, cart them around. Before we saw them. Yeah. 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 Like, how do you feel about playing like tourist guide to your friends? <sighs> yeah. So I've only again. <laughs> I so I work from home. You know. On, on a normal basis and so basically leaving the house like you it's like this is my compound so i never leave so i see the sun like a couple times a, 
a week. So let's just say this past, I've only been here for almost a year and I really don't know anything about Tennessee. So I can't really tell people like, oh, let's go check out this because I don't know where that is because I only go to the store every once in a while. That's well, it. we went to the Nashville. Johnny Cash Museum when I was there. Right, that's, right, that's downtown Nashville. So that's like kind of, again, low hanging fruit. Like that was just there. So I, like, know, I, like I knew about it. it though. I was like, there's got to be a museum or something down there. It's a music place. Yeah. yeah. There's, a whole, there's yeah. a whole bunch of them, actually, other ones. So. Oh, is there? Yeah, that's yeah, the other one. Yeah, there are. Yeah, there are. I always find it funny because when my friends come to visit me, I'll be like, yeah, like, let me take you to whatever, Venice. And I'm the one that's like on my phone trying to look through Google <laughs> Maps up. where to go. And my guests are the ones who are like, hang a left. It's left. It's right there. Like my guests oh, know LA better know? than I do. <laughs> wow. Yeah. See, I'm, I'm that. I'm, a, I'm exactly the same way. I'm yeah. like, people need to just go. Like stay somewhere else so that I don't, because I always feel like I have to take them and show them around, mm -hmm. and I don't, I don't know anything. So stay maybe somewhere else, and then I'll meet you for lunch. Yeah, you find a place, and I'll go there. Yeah, because I really don't know where to go. But Tennessee is nice if you ever get a chance. It's on my list. Nashville. Yeah. Nashville. I gotta get a good hat though if I'm gonna fit in. I gotta get some sweet cowboy There's tons of them. Good hat. They have they have boot places on the little strip. So oh. I'm sure they got hats in there too. Oh yeah, I'll I'm just sure. go. I'll just go to Nashville shop so I can dress like a Nashville gal and then come back home and wear my outfit yeah. in my compound. <laughs> there you go. I went to Nashville <laughs> once. <laughs> Look, I have proof. Yeah, the boots and everything. Yeah. Yes, and they have like tractor, like they have tractor. I don't want to say tractor pools, but they have tractors where they pull people and they go and they have their drinks oh, yeah. in a tractor. Like they pull them and they're like in a thing. See, if you did and... that in Bosnia, like people would laugh at you. Like farmers yeah. would be like, what? Why are you on my tractor drinking? Why are you using my tractor, a tool that I need for survival, for fun? Yeah, this is for food, not for parties. <laughs> yeah. No. And I could just see a stick or something poking them to get off. Yeah. Get off the, get off of here. Yeah, not like these novelty restaurants and like experiences that we have like in the States are so foreign to other people. Just like um, in Vancouver, I went to, actually I thought this was cool. It was a restaurant that's completely blacked out. So you can't like see what you're eating. You're, it's all about feel and sensory. And the idea was kind of like silly, but the cool thing that they did is that they did employ all of their waiters were people who were visually impaired. And so it was a great way to, you know, create employment. But just like the idea of a restaurant where you can't see the food you eat. Like when I explained that to my Bosnian parents, they were like, you paid money for that? <laughs> yeah. So and wait, how do you get to your seat? Do they like bring you to your seat or do you? You wait outside, you pick your order, and then a guide comes in and guides you through the dark restaurant, helps you to your seat. And then it's just pitch black for like two and a half hours. It's, it was wow. an interest. like, I don't think I'll do it again, but I realized yeah. how much, like, music and background people and, like, other restaurant goers play into, like, the dining experience. There were moments when I just was like, there's nothing to talk about because this is the time when I would, like, people watch or have a bite of my meal and enjoy the background music, but yeah. none of that was there. So you wow. have to be a good conversationalist if you want is to Is that your hand on my leg? <laughs> So you have to say that like every couple minutes. Is that your hand? Yeah. Am I holding your hand? Who is this? Who is this? That's not Mom? a hand at all. Mom? <laughs> uh, Mama? Yeah, that reminds me. In, in Vegas, they have a, or at least they used to. I don't know if it's still there, but they had a a bar that was completely of ice. Oh, they got rid of that a long time ago. Did they get rid of that? So I, I've been there. Oh, Basically, fun. it's a whole, it's like a, I don't know how cold it was. You had to, you had to get, so you're paying for warm clothes so they give you like these warm jackets so you have to pay for these jackets to wear and then you go in and then it's just people in an ice everything's made of ice in there like they have ice walls ice tables and i'm like this whole thing and it was expensive and you go in there and it's like this this is kind of this was pointless okay you just need to go to alberta if you want to experience that edmonton yeah. alberta canada will give you the same experience same thing from November till about April. <laughs> you had a big yeah. window. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess in Vegas, you know, it's the desert. So they were like, this is a great idea. Yeah. But 
And obviously Mark said it's not there anymore. But yeah, I went in there and that's kind of one of those things where it's like you go there once and you're like, this is, this. you could say you've done it because yeah. I do want to go check out your darkness dinner because that sounds fun. Try everything yeah. once. Exactly. Yeah. All right. We're going to start with our good old questions. Oh boy. I'm nervous. <laughs> oh, you ready? So I had one. So I picked these out beforehand, which is funny. I'm going to save this one for last because it kind of, it is funny, but I still, it, it can go with, with something. Okay. What is the nicest thing a stranger has ever done for you? Oh my God. Isn't it sad that the first thing I thought of is the worst thing a stranger did to me? No. Perfect. <laughs> Roll with that one. Worst thing. Okay. I was living in Toronto during actually one of the colder winters they had and I there was a homeless man on my corner that kind of hung out there all the time and one day I got him I always like acknowledged him but one day I gave him an apple because I had I was walking home from the grocery store and I'm like he must be hungry and I gave him the apple and he threw it at me and <laughs> was like I don't need this apple chucked it at me and then called me like a bunch of you know bad names but it was the funniest thing because like fast forward three days later and I paid there was like a, a shelter where you could pay for the night to host someone and so a few mm -hmm. nights later I paid and hosted him there and he like was so sweet and was like thank you bless you you're so kind and in my head I was like man three days ago you threw an apple at my head <laughs> look at that she turned it on Scott she did both look at that kind that of. was good yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, nice. I did something nice, but it didn't work out in my favor. And then I got <laughs> I got a thank you from him, which I I thought yeah. was nice. <laughs> so next time wow. instead of apples, just buy the alcohol. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> or he was he wasn't all the way come down, or he just did come down. Oh yeah, I can and go. and that's why he was so angry. I mean, I try my best. I just it's I was, hard to judge when yeah. at what level they're at. I should have just given a bag of chips. Also, no, but it's like the lady who gives out fruit at Halloween. I oh, had it yeah. coming. I had it coming. Yeah, yeah. Apple. Well, he could have used it. I, I was thinking he could have used it as a as a smoking apparatus. But, <laughs> um, yeah. Moving forward. If you could try, okay, if you could try out a job for a day just to see if you'd like it, which job would you choose? Ooh, my oh. bro. Dang. What would you have done? Maybe what would you have done if you didn't do acting, directing, writing? Well, here's the thing. I've always been fascinated by medicine. I would never be a doctor. I sucked at the sciences. But I... Um, I would love to see, I would love to be in the operating room when a neurologist is like working on a brain and like operating on a brain. Ooh. I don't, I'm not saying I need to be the neurologist operating, but you can like, be the assistant. Yeah, the like assistant. a nurse handing them the most viable apparatus they need. I think that would be nice. so cool. Also, the human body is interesting and not queasy, so I think that'd be cool to experience. Wow. An answer, but an just answer. to observe, yeah, I don't want to ask. It's, weir it's weird anymore. that you, you bring that up. I, I just watched X Files, the movie, for I don't know, the 18th million time. Is it the, Is the newest one? Yeah, the newest one, uh, 2008 or something like that. I don't think I even saw, saw that one. And they were, they were. What is it? Not not extorted, but they're basically taking the head off of the main villain, and, like putting it on someone else. Like a, nice. Oh, man, like a head transplant. Yeah, which, like, yeah. And they and they were uh, doing like the the sketchy, you know, just transplants, just the black market transplants. Mm, uh, I actually just read an article a couple days ago that the first operation where they transplanted a pig's heart into, into a human. human? Um, and, 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 and it worked, yeah, yeah it, it was a successful, successful surgery. surgery. So, so like, uh, operations where we're, you know, taking organs from other uh, animals are, 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 are starting to, to happen, which I think is just so crazy and cool. But like, yeah, that got me to thinking, I'm like, man, what if in the future you can do that? You can take like my head and put it on Beyonce's body, let's say. There you go. <laughs> yep. You never know. The sky's, the sky's the limit. You have to dream. One must dream. <laughs> One I, you dream. know what's funny? I would want to do that same exact thing. My head on Beyonce's body. Yep. yep. Get in line, brother. <laughs> wow. <laughs> nice, nice, guys. 
All right, so here's the one I was thinking that's actually hilarious, but I was in a dark thought. That's why I thought it was hilarious. So, okay. <laughs> so have you ever been kicked out of anything? If so, what? So the reason why I thought it was hilarious was because I was thinking of Bosnia. Uh, and, <laughs> that's but such I picked a good joke. Beforehand, <laughs> but I picked it up beforehand. But I was actually, thinking, well, maybe you could run with something like you're at a bar or something. But Well, yeah, here's the thing. I, I escaped Bosnia, but I was kicked out of Germany. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So that, uh, no, I've definitely... Unfortunately, I was a bit of an unruly kid. I've been kicked out of a lot of classes. And I remember specifically nice. in junior high, I had a really hot student teacher. I don't even, Mr. B was his name that we called him, but I, I would purposely act out in class so that I could get kicked out and get one on one time with Mr. B. Whoa. <laughs> and now you guys so live like, happily ever after in LA. Yeah, no, yeah. not at all. I was like a, you know, hormone crazed fourteen year old, and he was a very nice, like, uh, grown up man. Obviously, so like nothing happened. But you know, just like when you're in 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 junior high and high school, and you have a crush on like the only hot teacher in your school, you'll do anything to get their attention. See, see and that's how smart girls are, because most guys, or at least I, I was, I guess, one of the dumb kids, because I would have thought of something that clever to get one on one time <laughs> with with one of the hot teachers. It would be more like. I don't know, doing something stupid. But here was the problem. Um, I also have a twin sister and she would always follow my lead. So she'd get kicked out too. And then it'd be like fighting for oh, Mr. B's attention. Yeah, so uh, it backfired too. Do you, with having a twin, does it come down? Like sometimes do you guys have like the same taste in dudes and her same taste in general? You know what's funny? My my sister is married and has kids and happily married, might I add. But her yeah. dream, her, her dream boy, like growing up, I was obviously always into like athletes and cool guys because I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> and my sister's dream boy was like a guy, anybody who had glasses and red hair. <laughs> that was like wow. her dream boy. And uh, yeah, my partner has glasses and he's got a little bit of that ginger gingerness <laughs> and he's got freckles. So I actually. I ended up with my sister's dream man. Yeah. How funny. And every time we get together, my sister. And then she's with the athlete? Nah. No. Her husband plays soccer. She's with a good guy. Let's just leave it at that. He's a good man. But whenever whenever I visit, yeah, my sister always insists on taking a picture of like me, my partner, and then my sister. And my sister is always giving him a kiss on the cheek in every picture. So. I don't know. I don't know what yeah, that's Yeah, keep an eye on her. Yeah. 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 We're going to have a talk with her. She's good people, yeah. She's my roommate, and <laughs> yeah. she can hang. Yeah. yeah, that's good. Well, we cool. greatly appreciate that you came on the show. If you could, just tell our fans you know, where we can catch you at, uh, if you have any other projects coming up, and yeah, all your socials and stuff. Yeah. First of all, thank you guys for having me. So fun chatting with you both. You can find me at Elma Begovic. I'm on Instagram. I say Instagram, I don't know why it's Instagram. And my company website, Seek Refuge Productions, is under, under construction, construction right now, but my goal for 2022 is to keep most of my updates on there. And projects I'm working on right now, well, uh, The Day We Left is on a festival run right now, and we've actually secured a distribution deal in Canada, so it'll be on uh, small screens in Canada shortly. And pitching, I'm, I'm doing a lot of pitching right now. I'm pitching my first solo feature and I'm really trying to get like a web series off the ground that's what I'm like storyboarding right now and applying for a lot of grants you know I I need people to give me some money so that I can keep going that crest the crest money has stopped coming in my friends have cut me off my family will no longer give me birthday gifts so I need grants (laughs) dang it but yeah that's where I'm at on Instagram and Seek Refuge Productions Well, on that note, Amigos out. This has been the Amigos PC. Make sure to like, subscribe, and review us on all your podcasting platforms. And visit us at AmigosPC.net. Get our entire library of content and Amigos merch. Till next time. Adios.